The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. If you don't know better, uh, I am not Mark Kinkle. I will, uh, um, he has had some medical issues that have prevented him from showing up. So uh, you get to deal with me all day. Um, although I'm only talking once or twice, so it shouldn't be too bad. Um, so we're still at a small audience and I'm gonna do some housekeeping. We have lunch at noon. Uh, lunch is gonna be literally right outside these doors. You can bring it back in here. Um, and uh, so feel free to grab lunch. Um, we also, uh, unlike the schedule, say, unless you're looking at the web app, um, there are effectively no breaks um, today. So this is nonstop sessions uh, except for lunch. Just to give me an idea of the people who are in the room thus far, how many people are already using um, public cloud infrastructure like Amazon EC2 or S3? Okay. Um, who here, uh, anybody using private cloud already? What are you using for private cloud? Okay, and you? Okay. Um, what about uh, anyone who doesn't understand the difference between um, infrastructure, platform, and software as a service? We'll, I'll happily go through that, and if you already know it, okay. So, so real briefly, um, effectively, cloud computing is about abstracting away and providing end users access to things that they wouldn't normally have. And so um, the easiest example of that is software as a service. And in software as a service, the only thing the end user brings to the table is, uh, is their actual um, data. So Gmail is a great example of software as a service. You have an account, uh, your email flows in and out of that account, and uh, the only thing you're bringing from or taking out of Gmail is that email. Um, the uh, the other uh, the next layer below that is platform as a service, and effectively you bring your code and your data to that uh, to that type of environment. So think about something like Google App Engine or Heroku, and that's effectively platform as a service. You're bringing your application that's going to run on their platform, um, and you don't really have to understand or know anything about the the platform below it, the, uh, the app server or the operating system it runs on, you probably don't even know what operating system it runs on. And then of course, below that we have infrastructure as a service, which effectively provides you things like CPU, memory, storage space, uh, networking access, and everything above that you can control, everything below that is, uh, is a mystery to you and it's abstracted away. Um, so the NIST has a nice definition of, uh, of cloud computing, and I think it's it, the, their paper, it's a 30-page or so paper, is worth reading. But uh, I'll give you a four-part definition, which I think is easier to remember. And that is that cloud computing is awesome, and that is on-demand, self-service, scalable, and measurable. And if you don't have uh, each of those four components, you probably don't have um, you probably don't have cloud computing. So we're going to go ahead and, and, like I said, I know there's still a huge line out there, um, but unfortunately, our schedule is just incredibly packed today. Um, so uh, we'll talk about cloud stack. Um, you're free to do anything you want with this. You can find this on SlideShare. Uh, you're welcome to, to hack it or reuse it. Um, to give you a brief history of CloudStack, uh, the company that originally wrote it uh, was called VMOps, and it was founded in 2008. Um, they were a little small startup in Silicon Valley. They open sourced, as soon as they got it reasonably ready, they open sourced it uh, in May of 2010. Um, they released that under a GPL v3 license. 
And uh, they did something that most open source startups do. They did that all as an open core release. Uh, so 90% of the code was open source. The remainder was uh, proprietary. And the thought there was that uh, you may uh, you may find it completely useful, but if you want the, the really awesome features, uh, you would have to pay for it. Um, we were acquired by Citrix in July of 2011. Cloud.com uh, was the, had become the company's name by then. We were acquired in 2011. Um, and shortly after we were acquired, uh, literally less than 30 days, we dropped open core, uh, released it all under GPLv3. Um, and so all of those proprietary features um, became open source. We uh, did a complete re-architecture uh, in February of 2012, and, and in preparation for that, we started uh, working on getting uh, agreements from our contributors to, to switch to the Apache license. And so in April, early April of this year, we, uh, we switched to an Apache uh, license, and we also entered the Apache Software Foundation and uh, are currently in incubation. Uh, so we talked a little bit about infrastructure as a service. And so CloudStack is an open source infrastructure as a service platform. Uh, we support multiple hypervisors, and we're hypervisor agnostic. Uh, the, uh, the real strength of, of CloudStack comes from its networking capabilities. And we'll talk a lot about network in a bit. Um, but it can also handle things like high availability. Uh, it's, uh, and it was originally designed around a service provider model, so people who wanted to implement an EC2 analog. And so it's built with multi-tenancy in mind, so keeping all of the people uh, who have access to your, uh, your cloud separate uh, and isolating them from each other. And I just gave you, a, the previous screen gave you lots of buzzwords, but here's what it really is. Um, it provides separation for all of those tenants. It allows you to deterministically allocate resources. So you can say, I want all of the machines completely consumed before they begin consuming additional machines. Or perhaps I want to disperse them as much as possible so that a hardware failure uh, impacts each account minimally. Uh, you, can, you can use a number of different algorithms to determine how uh, resources are, are actually allocated to the end user. The, the real power, though, the thing that makes uh, cloud computing such a game changer is that, of course, it's exposing to the end user things that you would never let an end user do. So you would never give uh, an end user credentials on your F5 load balancer but you can abstract that F5 load balancer away and still allow them to configure it, provision uh, load balancing services, and all doing that without any input from, uh, from you, aside from giving them uh, access to it. Um, we also do managing high availability. Uh, we'll talk about that in a bit, but uh, be warned that that's a marketing term and doesn't really mean high availability. Uh, and no virtualization group that talks about high availability is really doing HA. Um, this is massively scalable. Uh, the largest private cloud implementation we have is upwards of 25,000 public or physical nodes that are running a hypervisor atop that, and of course, uh, a variable number of, of VMs on those nodes. Um, and of course, you don't want to hand over the keys and allow people to do anything they want because they'll, of course, use all of your resources, so you can apply resource limits. And uh, we also support measuring usage over time, which allows you to build back against uh, those folks. So if, you wanted, if you're in a public cloud environment, you're charging their credit card. If you're in a private cloud environment, you're probably charging back to, to their business unit. So we talked about multiple hypervisor support. These are the hypervisors we support today. Uh, KVM, Zen Server, Zen Cloud Platform, VMware, Oracle VM, uh, we can also support bare metal if your bare metal uh, has IPMI 2.0. IPMI is, um, uh, I think it's Independent Platform Management Interface, um, and it's a, effectively a lights out management um, uh, ability that comes on some uh, server hardware, on most server hardware. Um, and so a lot of people 
make the assumption that cloud has to do with virtualization. And while most clouds are, um, are heavily virtualized, that's not necessarily the case. And the people who are doing the really interesting things right now are not doing it with a hypervisor. They're doing just bare metal. Their workloads are big enough that they can consume an entire machine. Um, you're gonna see some additions to this. We've got some folks, um, some of our contributors currently uh, in Italy who are working on adding Hyper-V, if you care about uh, Hyper-V support. Uh, we also have, um, we have some folks who are working on things like LXC uh, and OpenVZ, so, although I don't currently know the state of that, so. So we talk about this multi-tenant separation, and when you effectively have, <coughs> when you effectively have these end users who can go and provision virtual machines, and they can provision potentially VLANs if you've allowed them to, uh, they can get external public-facing IP addresses, they can configure the firewalls, et cetera. You very clearly need to, uh, to be able to separate them so that you know, the people uh, who are developing software for the finance group, uh, can't, uh, that can't be uh, explored and, and uh, potentially see some sensitive data from a different group in the company. So, uh, this isolation is built largely around abstraction. So you don't know that you're dealing with a hypervisor or which hypervisor you're dealing with. Uh, all you know is that I get a machine and uh, if you're smart enough, maybe you can look around and figure out if it's running VMware or, or uh, KVM. But uh, you have no inherent knowledge of what hypervisor you're using. You also have no knowledge of the underlying storage that you're using. So uh, the, uh, you don't know if, uh, unless someone tells you in the service offering, you don't know if you're on SSD or 5400 RPM IDE drives. Um, that also means that you don't know where uh, that storage is residing. And quite honestly, you don't need to for most of the purposes. Networking, however, is designed to connect everybody. And so we've got a couple of different models for network uh, isolation. Uh, the first one is essentially providing uh, each account with a dedicated or isolated VLAN. Uh, we call that tag networking. Um, if it doesn't scale well, we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, uh, if you're doing a very small private cloud implementation, uh, that, will, uh, that will take care of, of all of your needs. But this is becoming very quickly considered legacy networking. Um, the idea that you would have a, uh, a VLAN available for every user, uh, and especially when you get users starting to do multi-tiered apps and needing multiple VLANs, it simply doesn't scale. Um, and so a lot of the large clouds are using a layer three isolation. Uh, Amazon's called that security groups, uh, and we've copied that term and a number of other folks have, have copied that term as well. Um, and then for the truly paranoid, uh, the three and four letter government agencies, um, they want the option to allocate to dedicated hardware. So three letter agency only uh, deploys their virtual machines on these networks and on this very specific hardware and no one else can use it. Uh, and you, know, you may have multiple of those very isolated um, isolated resource pools. Yes. Yeah. So we'll start down this networking road. Um, CloudStack has, right now in, in what's released, six network models. We've just started uh, going down the software-defined network route, so doing things like GRE tunnels. Um, and you're going to start seeing a lot more. There's some, there's some folks uh, uh, at a, a large um, IT services uh, group in Europe and uh, a little network company out in the Bay Area called Nasira that are about to dump a lot more uh, SDN work in uh, this week. But uh, assume that there are essentially six models, and here's how they, they're divided up. Uh, the method of isolation, so we talked about VLANs and security groups. 
Uh, that's one of the issues. The next is what kind of hardware are you using? Um, one of the unwritten tenets about cloud computing is that it's all about commodity. So having to put a um, six-figure router or a six-figure firewall in line to manage your, um, to manage your network, that, uh, that's not necessarily antithetical, but it's certainly not in the spirit of cloud computing. Um, and so the lowest common denominator is to virtualize that away as well. Uh, and so CloudStack has a, uh, a bit, essentially virtual networking devices uh, that provide a number of services. We'll dive into those a little bit. But we can also manage physical hardware. So if you have a Juniper SRX, uh, a F5 Big IP load balancer, NetScaler load balancer, uh, a Cisco um, Nexus 1000, uh, a number of other things, we can manage that hardware and again, allow your users to do things with that hardware without having direct access. So you should assume though that, um, that the default is that CloudStack's gonna manage uh, that entire network infrastructure. So I talked about the services that we manage with the virtual router and those are the base that we manage. Uh, so we'll take care of address allocation with DHCP. Uh, we'll also take care of VLAN allocation. So you'll provide us a range of VLANs to consume. And out of that range of VLANs, we will uh, uh, we'll start assigning them to individual accounts and we'll make sure that those remain isolated to those accounts. Um, we can do uh, firewall access. The end users can open ports on their firewall. Uh, in addition to DHCP, they can also grab public IP addresses and uh, they can do NAT port forwarding with those. Um, and of course, it, is a, uh, it does routing if you're, if you're not doing uh, layer three isolation, uh, we'll provide routing services for you. Uh, VPN endpoints and load balancing. So uh, that's what we're doing today. You'll start seeing a lot more, uh, a lot more things creeping in, uh, such as SSL offloading and uh, things of that nature. Um, but essentially, all of that's abstracted away from the end user. They see this in a GUI or are exposed via an API, and they can configure any of those services. And this is stuff that you don't need additional hardware for because it all runs as a virtual machine if you wish to do so. Now, obviously, if you're doing um, if you're doing intense amounts of traffic, uh, you may want to offload things like firewall or routing to uh, to physical hardware. But, uh, but that is extremely rare and it's getting rarer because you can, of course, scale up the number of, of these virtual network appliances uh, and, uh, and distribute that out uh, to make it scale up if, uh, or scale out if you need to. Yeah, so, so our, our effective decision has been that we will not support hardware that does not expose an API, which means that the vast majority of Cisco hardware we simply will not support um, because they want you to log in via terminal session and go and configure that hardware. Uh, that just, uh, that's uh, asking for trouble in, in the end. Um, so uh, if it exposes an API, and that means that uh, typically You'll see things like um, Big Switch, Nasira that, that's written and coming on but hasn't been in a release yet. Uh, Juniper hardware has always done real well with APIs, so they were some of the first uh, network hardware that we supported. F5 has also done that, so we'll support their load balancers, um, Netscaler, and uh, there's uh, Cisco has some high-end stuff that does API, and we'll, we already support their high-end stuff. But it, unfortunately, it's very high end, so. Um, any other questions? Because I know I'm burning through this pretty fast. All right, so, so uh, we talked about that you, can, uh, that you can manage these physical network uh, devices. Um, this is actually a little out of date because it only lists those three. Um, but uh, one of the nice things is you can mix and match these elements as, uh, as service offerings. So your end user can decide, 
you know what, I don't really care about this. Uh, this is all test stuff. I can use a virtual router and never have a second thought about it. Um, but maybe I want an F5 load balancer for production. So you can mix and match these and uh, uh, they just appear as different service offerings, which means that you can also provide different costs to them. So, you know, I charge X amount per quantity of traffic for the virtual router and I charge 2X that amount for an F5. So um, we're starting to do open flow stuff, but it, right now uh, the issue is that, that while a number of hypervisors have open flow support, they only support GRE tunnels. So if you want to do GRE tunnels, yes, we'll do that over open flow. If you want to do something else, you're probably not, and you're probably doing just native uh, layer two or layer three networking. Any other questions? All right, so let's talk about security groups. Um, traditionally, networking has been isolated via VLANs. Um, if, if you've been around for very long, you'll, you'll remember uh, people initially not trusting VLANs because it was all on the same uh, physical network. Uh, and we've actually become quite comfortable. VLANs are the standard for isolation now. Um, so some problems, uh, while VLANs isolate well, they have lots of problems scaling. The, uh, if you look at the actual standard, there's essentially 4,000 VLANs are permitted. Uh, you cannot exceed 4,000 VLANs in a single physical network. There's an additional problem in that most of the routing and switching hardware that you can buy for a reasonable price will only keep up with about 1,000 VLANs. Uh, if you're looking to support 4,000 VLANs in Cisco hardware, that's uh, easily six figures uh, to be able to keep up with all 4,000. Um, six figures for uh, a routing and switching device is, is not very commodity. And while you are not, it's not inherently part of the definition, you should assume that things that aren't commodity uh, probably aren't very cloudy either. Uh, and needing to scale 4,000 at a time uh, at a cost of six figures is just unreasonable, um, especially if you're doing this large scale. The bigger issue is that people tend to not like having these arbitrary limits. If I came to you and I said, you know, we're going to deploy this cloud and it's going to be awesome, and oh yeah, you can only have 4,000 consumers of your cloud. Um, that's probably a non-starter for most service providers and for larger enterprises as well. So Amazon ran into this early, and they use layer three isolation. So um, you'll get to see my pretty drawings um, in just a moment. So security groups, they assume that your layer two network is quasi-trusted. They assume that, uh, that you effectively are controlling what's plugging into that layer two network, and uh, they're going to assume that it's uh, um, they're going to assume that it's, uh, that it's, you know, your hypervisors, basically. Uh, you may have some management elements in there. Uh, if you cannot control this, control what's plugging into your layer two network, this is not going to work. And in that traditional uh, VLAN model, we have taken that router or occasionally we'll have a dedicated firewall device and there is a single point or maybe you've got two of them and you're doing things like uh, HSRP or VRRP to, to provide some redundancy. Uh, but you still have this single choke point where all of your filtering and all of your routing is happening. Uh, we're distributing that out and effectively we're using, if you're familiar with EB tables in the Linux kernel, um, effectively we're using a bridge device and that bridge device is acting as a distributed firewall uh, and a distributed routing, even though it's not really doing routing. Uh, a, a, uh, and we're distributing that out to each hypervisor. So instead of having a single firewall that has to process all of the traffic, we push all of that out to each hypervisor and we deny everything by default. So if this big yellow thing is a hypervisor, you have a bridged 
uh, abridged network interface. And here is your, by the way, this is my pretty beautiful drawing. Um, you have this layer two network. Here's your trusted layer two network. Everything that connects to both the hypervisor itself as well as the VMs on the hypervisor has to pass through that bridge. And so effectively, you're creating a, your choke point moves from a single one for your entire network or maybe a couple that are acting as a redundant pair and it's moving down to the hypervisor so that you end up having one of these on each one. That makes it far more scalable from the amount of traffic that it can handle, uh, as well as uh, the um, number of rules that you can pass. Um, so if a VM wants to talk to another VM on the same hypervisor, still has to go through the bridge, so it still gets filtered. Um, and if it wants to talk to a VM on another hypervisor, it has to pass through two of those bridges. Um, so you still maintain effective isolation. Um, and the default is to deny everything. The end user has to specifically open um, ports up uh, to allow traffic to pass. Anyone not understand security groups? Yes, sir. Yeah, or, or maybe even separate physical networks, right? Um, th this, is, this is all end user guest traffic, not on this same hypervisor, you may have a different uh, network that provides storage access. You may have a separate network that provides, um, provides management interface. Um, but this is actually the guest network for, for the virtual machines themselves. Yes, sir. So, I understand that, but I guess, what is the security group? Like, what is that? So, the security group is essentially a, for lack of a better word, a set of firewall rules. So, you, you would say security group web server one is going to allow uh, traffic in on AD and 443 from anywhere. And I will allow, because I want to, to manage this, um, over SSH, I will allow port 22 in from this set of subnets. And then that set of firewall rules, you can apply to any of your virtual machines, and that applies to them. So you can only apply a single security group. A virtual machine can only have a single security group applied to it, but an account may have multiple security groups that it can apply to its machines. Right, so, so the rules sit in this bridge and are deployed effectively uh, constantly. I think the default polling, they get updated if you do something to a virtual machine uh, that's running on the hypervisor, uh, but I think the default polling is every five minutes. So every five minutes we will check to make sure that the, the security groups or that, that set of rules um, is in a consistent state with what the management server is expecting and uh, we will change it uh, if something is errant there. Any other questions? Yes. So this is the configuration. This is the content type of one big server that you want. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, and effectively the, the issue there is that one big server, A, tends to be more of a single point of failure, uh, and it also tends to be uh, not nearly as scalable when you're talking about tens of thousands of machines. Um, it becomes a lot harder to, to uh, push all of that traffic through a single place. And you know, that has its own scaling limits. Effectively, you know, if you start running out of capacity on one of these bridge interfaces, you spin up another node and you just doubled your, you have to obviously redistribute VMs, but you effectively doubled your, your uh, filtering capacity. Yes, sir. So each hypervisor uh, has, each hypervisor in the same zone has all of the rules. So they know it, they know all of the rules across the platform. Because you, can't, you have no idea where the VMs are going to end up, right? Yes, sir. I, 
I will tell you that there are people at massive scale, obviously, who are pushing uh, upwards of 120 gigabits a second through those bridges. So uh, now, not saying that those bridges are not a choke point, but you can effectively scale them out. So yes, it becomes a choke point at 500 megabits a second. Um, okay, so spin up another one and we can, we can handle potentially another 500 megabits a second. So this is a controversial um, networking model. Networking people, most traditional networking people hate this. First of all, they don't like this quasi-trusted, um, they don't like the quasi-trusted layer two um, network. They really don't like the distributed, effectively distributed firewall, um, distributed firewall uh, uh, methodology. So, um, but compared to, you know, limiting yourself to 4,000 VLANs and then having to have the uh, hardware that would support that, this is a lot more scalable and you will see, you will see some of the largest um, uh, cloud and hosting providers adopting this. Yes? Um, typically, this doesn't get uh, as much concern as the actual uh, device that provides um, all of the networking services. The, the, we call it a virtual router. Um, that tends to cause more concern out of them than this. Um, I think that from a, uh, I have not seen any CSOs complaining about this in particular. Um, and I know that this is in use at three and four letter government agencies. So um, they effectively consider that, you know, they can use things like SE Linux to harden how this traffic is passing and not complain. Uh, they can't do things like that with Cisco. They're, they're having to trust that the Cisco is hardened. So they, in, in some ways they think that it's giving them a little more control and it probably is because, you know, with Linux you can tinker with anything. Um, but uh, I haven't seen anyone complain. Now, at the same time, those same folks are saying, this is great, but one set of hardware, one network for very specific people. So um, especially people that are doing multi-agency clouds and have those uh, government type security concerns are, uh, they want everything extra isolated. So even when they're using this, uh, all of the traffic that's passing here is of the same type and for the same group within that agency. Um, so maybe their concerns aren't quite the same as someone who's running a public cloud. Uh, at the same time, you know, Amazon is, is doing this and you don't, uh, uh, as of yet, you haven't heard of a, a networking related breach there. You do not. I mean, you might use them for, for auxiliary things like storage network, but effectively this is a single flat layer two network that's exposed to the end users. So no, no VLANs at all. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and you can isolate by zone or, or have dedicated pods or clusters uh, to individuals that would kind of escape uh, using this as the sole method of isolation. Yes, sir. Right. So, if you go into layer two, yes. So, the bottom is one big bus, and then you have a No, because effectively the bridge squelches all of that. So, so your your broadcast traffic would come from things like these VMs, and they get squelched coming out the bridge because we de deny by default. Right, users coming in. But remember, this is a quasi-trusted layer two network that only the hypervisors, which means they've got a bridge filtering each one, is going to, to, um, to be allowing traffic. And we've seen people doing this at 10,000 physical nodes on a single flat network and not have problems with broadcast storms. 
Although that was my first, I was like, you're putting 10,000 physical nodes and, and there's a reason we had VLANs um, and broadcast storms was one of them. It does, yes. Depends upon what you're trying to comply with, right? Um, so first of all, things like PCI DSS and, and HIPAA are largely, you must document and justify why you're, you're making decisions. Um, I've not seen folks who have, have had compliance issues and, and there are lots of people who are operating these clouds and SCIFs. And typically if you don't see them from them, you won't see them from, from corporate folks. So. Yeah, and, and so you can, you can do all of this on the cloud level and still have another layer higher than that that doesn't get exposed to the end user. Um, I will tell you that there are, there are very, very large multinational corporations who frequently discover that their end user's way of uh, getting things done is to plop down a credit card and use AWS, and it scares them to death. Um, there's a, uh, a $40 billion a year software company that discovered that their flagship product was being developed on Amazon. Uh, with zero security controls, each development group's manager was plopping down credit cards and uh, their board of directors literally freaked out. Um, and so this, by contrast, is a lot easier to swallow than, oh, my user plopped down his credit card deployed some unknown AMI on Amazon and security has no centralized control of anything in that perspective. So it, it, in many ways, in many ways it's, uh, it's which risk is less. And um, I went to, a, I went to a, a government open source conference a couple of weeks ago and I asked people to tell me if they were using cloud computing and virtually no one raised their hand. I said, well, that's not my experience. My experience is that unless you're operating in a skiff where you've got everything literally cut off uh, and there's an air gap, that every single one of your companies or agencies is using cloud computing. You just don't know about it. Your, your end users are working around you if you're not providing them the service up front. Um, all right, so we'll, we'll move on if, any, if no one has any other questions. I'm happy to talk about this. Mm -hmm. uh, so accounts cannot share rules. Uh, rules are specific to accounts. Right, yeah. All right, so we will move on. So this is the marketing term. Um, high availability was something that uh, used to be greatly revered. You had tools like Linux HA, Corusync, um, Zookeeper, uh, you still have those tools. They do real high availability. Um, and I, I want to say that VMware came up with this term in relation to virtualization. And uh, they really should have used, and, and we should have too, but apparently RFMTTR doesn't look great on a marketing slick. So uh, really fast mean time to recovery is what it is when you're talking about it in a virtualization and cloud space. And Effectively, this allows you to monitor that the machine is up, that the hypervisor it's running on is up, and if it's not, we'll restart it for you. Um, so this does not prevent outages, it does not guarantee availability, but it will, uh, it will hopefully reduce your, your mean time to recovery. Um, cloud and cloud stack and anything else that some vendor wants to sell you is not a magical solution for high availability. Um, they may provide some interesting tools, but uh, generally in, in any cloud space, uh, you move from, and this has been a trend generally, you move from uh, trying to guarantee uptime to assuming that there will be failure. 
Uh, so in the old days, we used to buy really, really expensive mainframes, and they would typically come with their own service person who you would have to provide office space for, and they would only allow the vax priests to, uh, to deal with it. And slowly we've begun commoditizing that. So then we had really high grade hardware that was a little bit cheaper, but it had redundant power supplies, redundant fans, it had RAID with redundant, so you would have redundant hard drives, redundant storage. You might even be able to hot swap memory. Um, that was very, very expensive. And it did a better job of providing availability, but it didn't do as good a job as that, uh, as that mainframe that had its own service personnel and, and everything was completely redundant inside it. Today, most of the places that are building data centers are using things uh, similar to the open data center spec, and, or at least the innovative places. Um, and so it's super commodity hardware. Um, there's no redundancy. There's probably no real storage attached. And so a machine may let the magic smoke escape, and you have to assume that that's going to happen. Um, any cloud environment uh, failure is assumed, which means that you're going to manage availability at the application rather than managing it via hardware and, and other things. Um, and so, for instance, we actually do real HA with our redundant router. Um, we realize that if you're using our virtual networking appliance, that if it goes down, even if we're going to restart it, you've got at least a minute, maybe two, of outage. And if you just took down an entire network, you took down, um, you took down potentially hundreds or thousands of virtual machines. And so we use VRRP, which is effectively an application level um, availability scheme to make sure that there is a router that is available all the time for that network. Um, and that is something that is an option that you can, that the end user can select. So if they need uh, decent availability for their networking, they can choose that. So uh, one of the other um, really innovative things that CloudStack did early on was determining where you, you push VMs um, or physical hardware, um, how you allocate storage, um, because you may have very fast storage and very slow storage, and you want to make sure that those are not just handed out um, in some uh, in any manner that, that happens. So CloudStack has a number of allocation algorithms. Um, the default is first fit, so the first um, zone, pod, cluster, and host that we show is available to fulfill the needs that you require, uh, we'll stuff the VM there. Uh, it's not terribly efficient, but it works. It allows you to provision faster. Um, we also have fill first, which means I've got a set of resources and I want to completely fill them before I um, move on to the next host. So you will start with one machine. That machine will be completely filled before it moves on to the next machine. We also have dispersion, which says for a given account, I want their, uh, their virtual machines on as many hypervisors, as many physical hosts as possible, so that if a uh, physical host goes down, I have minimized their uh, any downtime that they may have. Those are, you can also write your own. Those are comparatively complex. Uh, we have some simple things if you, if you want to make it really simple. So you can do things like tagging fast storage and then have an, a, a service offering for fast storage. Uh, so that's real quick. That says, here is fast storage and I'm going to go apply, uh, offer this service offering so that a person can go out, reach out, and pick fast storage or uh, really fast network um, and can do that uh, real, very easily because you've made a service offering that has that tag. Um, effectively, that's, that's labeling, uh, matching the service offering as a label and, uh, and the resource you're trying to acquire has a, a matching label and you match the two up and you get access to it. Um, we also have OS preference, and we do that for a number of reasons. First of all, some hypervisors support uh, certain operating systems better than others. Um, if you want to do 
the maximum number of Linux um, virtual machines, you're probably looking at uh, using Zen Cloud Platform or Zen Server uh, because it can do paravert. And, uh, and so that's typically a little faster. You can have that OS preference specified. But also from a licensing perspective, if you have to deploy Microsoft Windows and you have a data center license, they're typically charging you by the socket. And so if you've got two sockets in a machine, you can have that machine dedicated to Windows and you can run as many VMs as you can stuff on that and it doesn't increase your licensing cost. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of service providers and private enterprises prefer that OS preference model and dedicate some hardware to specific uh, hypervisors. You'll also see this um, from, uh, from places like Oracle with their databases. Yes? Yeah, you can have multiple different hypervisors. You choose one. Yeah. Right. Yes. So, so we require clusters to be homogenous, but above the cluster level, we don't care. You can mix and match. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's a, a networking or a, a managed service provider out in the Midwest uh, called Contigix, and their cloud offering they call MiraCloud, which runs CloudStack, and they offer VMware. KVM and Zen server all in the same cloud, and you obviously pay different amounts for, for using the different hypervisors. But yes, you can mix and match between them. Any other questions? Yeah, uh, let, let, me, let me, I've got some slides that address that, and we'll show you the structure in a bit. Um, so we talk about usage. Um, and so CloudStack does not inherently do billing, but CloudStack will track usage and dump that to a database for you and uh, we'll, uh, we'll track things like CPU usage, uh, VM count, we do, that, we do that all over time. Uh, and we have folks that are doing uh, everything from pulling that data via the API and dumping it into Excel or alternatively dumping it into uh, into a billing program or SAP or some other ERP system. Um, and essentially that just gives you, allows you to say, hey, this account, and you know, we'll say that that was done by this development group. Uh, they've consumed this, uh, this quantity of resources over this month and you know, figure out, uh, you can start by looking at usage trends to figure out when you need to buy hardware and other things. All right, so um, real high-level architectural view. This is what a cloud looks like. Um, so we have, we have an idea of primary and secondary storage. Um, let's start with secondary storage. Effectively, we use that to manage uh, templates and snapshots. So um, if you snapshot a virtual machine, which is typically going to be a crash-consistent crash snapshot, um, we will move that off to, um, to secondary storage, which typically is going to be slower than, uh, than primary storage. Um, we have historically only supported NFS, but we recently added object storage capability. Uh, we wrote this for OpenStack Swift, but Coringo and Gluster uh, have, been, have been making this work as well. And um, so, so uh, you, can, you can use object storage as well and push all of that out. Um, secondary storage VM effectively uh, will, in addition to just storing that, it provides aging of snapshots. So if you have a, uh, if you say, I want to snapshot this machine every day, um, but I only want to keep 10 days worth, once uh, a snapshot hits day 11, we'll scavenge it and and effectively make that available for reuse. Um, have I confused anyone with secondary storage? Questions? Great. All right, so primary storage. Um, 
and let me step back and say that uh, you won't understand it now, but secondary storage is for an entire zone. So uh, an entire zone shares a single secondary storage resource. With primary storage, uh, it is um, shared by a cluster, and we, we by default make, um, we provide GUIs to, uh, to provision NFS, iSCSI, and clustered LVM today. Um, there are a couple of others that are coming online that you'll see shortly, but uh, we can also make use of local storage, uh, but no fake HA and no live mig migration with local storage. So you need to make sure that your application is okay with ephemeral machines, uh, because if the host dies, the machine's going with it. Um, Cloud, CloudStack for most hypervisors can handle uh, anything that all the hypervisors can mount and write to. So a, any storage resource uh, in, um, in Zen server, any shared mount point that's got a clustered file system behind it uh, in KVM, uh, and of course, uh, you're limited to NFS and iSCSI for, um, for VMware. Um, so, yeah, sorry. Difference between, oh, so primary storage is where the actual uh, disk images run from, the running disk images. Secondary storage is where snapshots and templates are stored, and it's wider scope. So uh, you would deploy a template, and that may end up getting deployed to eight different, um, eight different primary storage resources. Only a single copy of the template will reside in secondary storage, and it'll push it out to each of those clusters. Uh, and same thing, it, it's pulling all the snapshots from all the clusters back into a single place. So if you want to deploy that snapshot as a virtual machine, you're not limited to the same cluster. Any other questions? Yes? Yes, you can do rolling snapshots. So, so typically that happens over a dedicated storage interface if you're doing that at any scale. Um, and a lot of times people bond those to, to eat, scale that up even more. Um, and you can have multiple secondary storage resources per zone, even though the zone can share, shares all of those zone wide, you can have multiple of those to also scale that out. And the secondary storage VM will we will spin up additional secondary storage VMs to handle the traffic, um, and, uh, but the secondary storage VM manages all of those resources uh, as a single entity to the cloud, to your zone at least. So we have, um, we have some somewhat arbitrary divisions of, of resources. We have zones, pods, and clusters for hardware. Um, typically, a zone has been a, a specific geographic location, uh, a data center um, equivalent to an availability zone. The things that it, uh, that it shares, um, that single secondary storage resource or resources are shared across an entire zone, and you have a single network model. So if you're doing VLANs with virtual routers, you're deciding that at the zone level. If you want to switch to something else, you're you're uh, creating another zone. So you can have multiple network models in a single cloud, and they're divided by zone. So you'll see some places that will divide their data center up because they want to provide VLANs for, for some customers and uh, are okay with layer three isolation for others. So pods. Um, Generally, and, and depending upon your scale, this has been a rack of machines or a row of racks. Um, this is where your guest network is defined. So your guest network address space is defined at this level. And effectively, uh, all of the clusters and hosts and, and virtual machines will share that guest network. So then we have clusters. And here's where we require um, that things start being the same. They need to be the same hypervisor, the same CPU, the same networking, which means that if your storage network plugs into ETH0, 
it needs to plug into ETH0 on every single host in, the, in that cluster. Um, and the, the issue there is we're assuming that we're going to be able to migrate between hosts in the cluster. Um, primary storage is cluster specific, so each cluster is going to have its own primary storage resource. And this is done for a number of reasons. So, so most of the hypervisors, depending upon who you talk to, KVM recommends that clusters be, um, be somewhere between a dozen and 16 nodes, uh, if you listen to Red Hat. Um, Zen Server says eight, but no more than 16 uh, in a cluster. Uh, so that, that effectively is the hypervisor manufacturer or, or author's recommendation. And um, that still gives you enough to, to move things around if you need to do maintenance or if a host fails, um, but also keeps that manageable uh, because things like Zen Server want to talk to all of the hosts in a cluster and it starts getting uh, significant overhead at, at once you get past 16 or so. Simply because the, the hypervisor manufacturers are s setting those limits. Uh, for instance, Zen Server, you cannot put more than 16 nodes in a, in a cluster. It will, it will fail to add additional nodes. Um, and also, we, if you're trying to support this, while you can add you know, n number of KVM machines, if you had to go to Red Hat for support, they would say, you know, we've recommended that you stick it around a dozen and you've got four dozen and that's not gonna work. So this is, this is some of this is actually in, uh, is hard coded in the hypervisor. Some of this is just the people who do this all the time and who wrote the software say that you shouldn't be doing that. So you should not be doing that. And this is a best practice more than a, a hard limit. All right, so we have a plethora of networks, um, and this gets terribly confusing, especially because three or four of these might be the same network depending upon your network model. Uh, so we have a management network where hypervisors and the management server communicate. We have a private network, uh, which is the network that the system VMs, which are the virtual router, the secondary storage VM, and the console proxy VM um, all use. Uh, we have a public network which is typically an internet facing network. Uh, we have a guest network, which is where the VMs are spin, uh, spun up and, and can access the network. Uh, and typically we'll have either the guest and public will be the same if you're using um, uh, what's called basic networking, or you'll get a, an address via NAT um, uh, back to the guest network. And then we do a lot of things over link local. So, we will talk directly to the hypervisor, which will then talk to uh, one of the system VMs, depending upon your hypervisor that you're using. Um, so we've got lots of networks. They're confusing and poorly named. Yes. Um, it, in some ways, in some deployments, yes. Uh, in the most complex, each one of these would be a separate, either a separate VLAN or a separate physical network, physical interface. Uh, in some, uh, you might have exactly one physical interface and all of this is done on that physical interface. So it really depends upon your, uh, on your networking model. So we have a management server that manages all of this. Uh, it's stateless. Uh, state is stored in a database. Um, all of the UI functionality is done via API calls, so there's nothing magical in the UI that you can't do elsewhere. Um, and we've currently got this scaling up to about 8,000 nodes can be managed by a single management server, 8,000 physical nodes. Um, and, uh, and of course you can have lots of them, or if they all die, uh, things will continue, you just won't be able to provision new services, so nothing falls over. Uh, if, if all of your management servers die. So we have a RESTful API, um, and 
This is no longer true. We, we used to listen on port 8096 on localhost uh, and allow you to make API calls uh, without authenticating yourself. We no longer do that. That's turned off by default. Um, we do, uh, the, the default is that we'll listen on uh, port 8080. And so you can see, here's the, the URL for that API call. Uh, the green highlighted stuff is the API key. So I'm telling it my identification. Uh, the command, the, the blue section there is to deploy a virtual machine and that yellow section are the arguments to it. So I'm saying deploy a virtual machine, the service offering is this, so how much RAM, memory, etc. Uh, the template ID, uh, so what disk image I want to deploy, and then the zone ID, so I'm telling it what availability zone. And then I've got a, uh, a secret key that provides, allows me to hash all of this and confirm that I really am, really am who I say I am. Yeah, yeah. It, so it's not an exact API. We've we've got an EC2 API uh, interface as well that will sit and listen, and you can pass uh, you can pass commands, your EC2 commands, like from Bodo or um, Yuka tools. And, uh, and argue against, uh, provide those arguments as if you were talking to EC2. And, uh, and that works. That used to be a separate piece that we called CloudBridge. Um, that has been merged into to the core of CloudStack. So now there are two API interfaces that are listening. Any other questions? All right, so I'm going to, yeah, go ahead. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Asterisk. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, 
We've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a, a thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out, and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer bootcamp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail, and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack well, management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack, as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the cloud stack. <laughs>